Merry Christmas, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to worship today. We're so glad you're with us, and, and maybe if this is your first time with us, here is what we want you to know. We want you to know that we are praying that this is your not, not your last time with us. Hey, we know that all of you, you gathered together with family, with friends, you heard the Christmas story read on Christmas Eve, but today we're going to do something unique. We're going to tell the Christmas story in a little different way. We're going to break it down for you. We're going to start by hearing how both Mary and Joseph heard in their own unique ways that they were going to bring into this world the Son of God and Jesus. We're going to hear the story of the shepherds. We're going to hear the story of those wise men. And finally, we're going to hear the story of this Jesus being born in that manger. We're going to hear it in song. We're going to read it from the Bible together. And then we're going to hear it interpreted through the voices of myself and Maddie Elliott, our intern pastor, as well as Pastor Angie. We hope this allows you to continue to celebrate the most important event of our Christian faith. That this Jesus came into this world for people like you and people like me. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Merry Christmas, everyone. I'm so excited to worship with you online. My name is intern pastor Maddie Elliott, and it's just a joy to celebrate this Christmas season with you. Now, I know many of you are on break in some way, shape, or form. And those of you who are in school, uh, this isn't going to come as a surprise to any of you. But for the rest of us who are past our school days, I want to hearken us back. Hearken us way back to elementary school and our gym days. You remember being in gym class as a school child. And we would always divide into teams for that volleyball game or that, that soccer game or whatever it was and my gym teacher would always pick a captain and then tell the captain to pick the rest of their team did that happen to anyone else well I was such an eager child I loved to play games I loved phi ed class and I always wanted to be picked first I wanted to be picked first or maybe picked in the top five I wanted to be chosen for the team I wanted to be favored good enough to be picked first. Well, maybe this will come as a surprise to you, but I was rarely picked as one of the first kids on the team. Maybe it was because I was uncoordinated or too skinny, but I was just rarely picked in those top spots on the team. And I always wanted to be. And as I got older, and maybe this has happened to you too, the things that I wanted to be chosen for, well, the stakes were higher. I wanted to be chosen for that job or that promotion. I wanted to be chosen by that special someone. And now that I'm a mom, even things like I want to be chosen to have my kids pick me as the parent to read to them before we go to bed at night. There's something in me that always desires to be chosen, to be favored by the ones I love, to be favored by the people that are around me, to be chosen, to be picked. I always want that. And, you know, sometimes I'm even surprised when it happens. And I think I'm most surprised when I don't think I deserve it. For an example, one year ago, in one week, I lost my dad and I had a baby in the same week. It was such a wild time for me. And truthfully, it was so dark. I was deep in grief and my body was all in its postpartum weirdness. It was such a dark time and I felt so broken and so full of confusion and it was so dark. And what happened then is people in my community, my friends, my family, people I worked with, people that I knew from church or just from town reached out to me in a variety of ways through notes and texts and phone calls. People showed up with food at my door. And even though I was in that dark space, sometimes I couldn't even answer the text message or even come to the door to say hello. I remember being so surprised. Why had these people reached out to me? I'm so broken. I'm not fun right now. I'm not worth reaching out to. I, I don't have anything to give back. I remember being bewildered and perplexed at why they had chosen me to care for in those moments. But it was in that care and compassion that I was lifted out of that dark space, reminded that I was loved and cared for enough to come back and be renewed and have my spirit filled again and again, even as I worked through all the grief that comes in waves. I was reminded through my community that I was chosen. I was chosen to be in the community and that they cared for me. Well, Mary tells us a lot about what it's like to be chosen. In the beginning of Luke, we hear the story of Mary. We hear all about how Mary has learned that she will carry Jesus, the Messiah, the one who has came to save God's people. And Mary tells us a lot because when she hears the angel come and say, Mary, you are favored by God. Greetings, you are favored by God. 
Mary responds in a way that I can really understand. She responds by being perplexed. She's perplexed and she hasn't even heard about the Jesus part yet. All she has heard is, Mary, you are favored by God. You've been chosen. You've been picked. This teenage girl looks at the angel with bewilderment, confusion. She's troubled. And eventually, after hearing of the news that she's going to carry this baby, she asks this question. She says, how can this be? How can this be? She's struck with bewilderment. How can this be? Me, this teenage girl, this unwed child, how can I be the one to carry this Jesus into the earth? How can I be the one responsible to care for him and nurture him into the man that he will become, the son of God? How can this be? And I think we ask this question too when we encounter things of this world that we don't understand. How can this be? How can this be that God has a plan for us even in the midst of a pandemic? How can this be that God has a plan for me even in my grief or even in my sorrow? How can God have a plan for me that is good even when I walk through the darkest valley? Well, Mary teaches us something really important through her faith. Because Mary in this story, in this beginning of Luke, she goes from this. She goes from a peasant girl to a prophet through her faith in God. She goes from Mary to mother of God. She goes from being in denial, how can this be, to becoming a disciple of Jesus who will come through her. Mary shows us what it's like to ask the question, how can this be, and then respond with our faith, our faith that God has promised to be with us to love us and has a plan for good and not for evil, for you. You see, through this story, we hear something important. We are taught through Mary not to respond with who we think we are, but who God has called us to be, to live into the faith that God has a plan for us. So this Christmas season, my prayer for us is that we can have the faith. We can have the faith that Mary shows us so that when we encounter the questions, how can this be? How can this be? We can respond with, let it be with me according to your word, just like Mary. Amen.
And there were shepherds living out in fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When I was growing up, my mom used to over and over again say to me the popular saying, show me who your friends are and I'll show you your future. <laughs> or sometimes it's put like this. It says, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Now, I'm not really sure who originally wrote this, but it's meant to serve as both a warning and a prophecy for young people, young, awkward, wayward teenagers like myself. It was in the middle of my sophomore year of high school. My dad came home from work and announced that we were moving from Eden Prairie, Minnesota to Dallas, Texas. That's right, right in the middle of high school. And I'll admit to you that I was an angry teenager about the entire ordeal because I didn't want to leave my friends and go start over again in the middle of my sophomore year in a whole different state. But uh, I didn't have any choice. I had to go with my family. And so after packing up all of our things, we got in our van and we headed down south on Interstate 35. And the weather got warmer as we approached our new home, which, as you can imagine, a move from Minnesota to Texas, it was quite a culture shift. I went from snow pants to cowboy boots. I went from a Minnesota Vikings fan to a Dallas Cowboys fan overnight. And I'll admit to you, I was nervous to start the school year in the middle of a school year because I had imagined that everyone in my high school had already found their friend groups, that they had already had their friend groups established, and that I'd have to sort of kind of wiggle my way into one of those. And as I tried to find a high school friend group in this new environment, my mom, she sort of watched me with this level of anxiety. 
once in a while I drifted over to this group of maybe cool kids who were into maybe not such good things and you could see the tension on my mom's body. But then I would drift over to this group from church and she would encourage me to hang out with them a little bit more. And then over to some friends from band and theater classes and then back to a group that was a little rough around the edges. I was working hard to try and find my place in this new high school experience in Texas. Tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. I was trying to find out who I was. And it becomes true in our lives that, that we are influenced by the people that we hang out with, by the people that we spend our precious time and energy with, with all the people that are in our inner circle. When we spend time with them, we take on their habits and their mannerisms and their language and that we are in the sway of the people that we are surrounded with. So it should be to our great shock and amazement that when the first birth announcement of the baby Jesus occurs in a field near Bethlehem, that it comes to some shepherds. Some shepherds who are out working, shepherds who are outside and separate from society and not there in the city, but they are out on the outskirts of town. You see, shepherds, they were unclean. They were separate from holy people. They are people who had nothing to offer unless you're looking for some lamb chops or some dirty kinds of wool. You see, these shepherds, they were dirty from their wanderings and they were anything, anything at all but devout. They were not the kind of people that your mom would want you hanging out with. I mean, if a savior is born, you'd expect more of a fancy kind of birth announcement. Maybe something royally proclaimed to those within spheres of influence. Like if you were to offer something to a new king, you'd expect a full parade about it. You'd expect political leaders to be there and rulers of countries, or maybe at least the mayor of Bethlehem. You'd expect that announcement to go to someone who had some clout, some, some way of delivering this super important news somebody who could do something with the news. But this isn't who God chooses to send God's angels to. Instead, God sends those angels to the shepherds, to the least, the last, the lost, and the lowest of all of society, to the working class, to the outcurse, to the stinky, to those who are too busy tending to their flock to keep up with the cleanliness customs that the law required. Those people who were too busy with daily life and the kept the, their daily life kept them from the demands of worshiping, kept them actually from going to church. Tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. But it's exactly to this group of people that the angel appears to the shepherds and announces, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause you great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Then more angels show up and proclaim glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to all those for whom his favor rests. The shepherds, they don't have anything to offer the Savior but they still take this message and they hurry to go find where the baby is. They run off to go see what this whole commotion is all about. Tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Friends, it is no accident at all that the one who would later call himself the good shepherd, the one who others call the lamb of God is first greeted by shepherds in this world. Isn't that amazing? Jesus' first friends and visitors aren't the rich. They aren't people who've got it all figured out. They aren't people who've got their stuff together at all. Jesus' first friends are the opposite. They're people that no one wanted to hang out with. They're, they're outsiders with nothing to offer, nothing to give, nothing. They're shepherds. And it is just as true for us as it is true for Jesus. Jesus came for all people, outsiders like shepherds with nothing to give, for, for messy people, for, for struggling people, for those who work hard to show that they've got it all together, for addicted people and diagnosed people, for lonely people. And for you, Jesus came for you, whether you have it all together or whether your life's like a messy shepherd, Jesus came for you to be his friend.
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. One of our family's favorite vacation destinations is the North Shore of Minnesota. Every year, at least once, maybe twice a summer, we make the trek across Minnesota to Duluth, and then we head north up the North Shore. Now, if you've been to the North Shore as many times as we have, you know that there are two distinct routes you can take up the North Shore. You can either take the expressway, which is the most efficient way. It's off away from the lake, carved into the forest, and you can fly 70 miles an hour up the North Shore. The other route, which has become our family's favorite route, is to take Old Highway 61. It's this old highway that meanders right along the lake shore. It takes you through little tiny towns and villages along the way up the North Shore. It's much slower. It's really slow. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of places along the shore where you can stop and skip rocks, places where you can sit and watch the sailboats, the ships go by, places you can stop and enjoy a picnic lunch. And there are also little shops in all these little towns, places like Russ Kendall's Smokehouse, where we always stop and get smoked fish. There's this place called the, the Great Lakes Candy Kitchen, where we, our kids love to stop and get their favorite homemade candy. We've come to appreciate this slower route. Rather than the efficient 70 miles an hour, we've more so, well, we've more so found ourselves taking the slow route. And I think part of the reason that we've, we've done that is, I don't know about you, but we find ourselves in life running a lot. We're always running from place A to place B, running to concerts, running to events, running to work commitments, running to our kids' practices and tournaments. Whatever it might be, we find ourselves running, always trying to find the most efficient and the fastest route from point A to point B. If even just for a moment on vacation, it gives us a moment to sort of shift gears, to reset. These two routes up the North Shore actually remind me of the Magi in the Christmas story. In just 12 verses in the book of Matthew, we hear the story of the Magi. And I love the story of the Magi for several reasons. Uh, the first is this. Uh, we often call them kings or wise men. We, we make them sound like royalty. The fact of the matter is these guys were 
what we call a magi, but a better translation was astrologers. They were the kind of people who studied the stars and horoscopes and the zodiac. You see, they weren't uh, uh, of royalty in the least. And these strange characters from the East are the first, some of the first characters to welcome this Jesus into the world, along with a few scraggly shepherds. They weren't religious in the least. And it reminds me of the sort of people that God came into the world to be with in this Jesus. Another thing I love about the story, the story of the Magi is that when it comes to, to those characters from the East, think about the gifts that they brought. They brought gold. They brought frankincense. They brought myrrh. Gold was a gift for kings. Myrrh uh, was this ointment that came from likely Arabia. Uh, uh, Frankincense was an incense that came all the way from India that was only often used by the, the high priest at the temple. These were were gifts that these men adored. They were precious to them. They gave up what they adored to adore this Jesus who came into this world. But the thing I think I love the most about this story of the Magi comes in the very last verse of those 12 verses in the book of Matthew. As the story of the Magi closes, after they've seen Jesus, they've come to know his story. The author of the book of Matthew says this. He says, they returned to their country by another route. By another route. Now, presumably on their way from the far east to Bethlehem, they took the fastest, the most efficient route. They, they hopped on their camels and flew down the four-laned expressway from the east all the way to Bethlehem. But it says they returned by a different route, presumably a slower route. You see, I wonder if after meeting this Jesus, if they couldn't not return by another route. Yeah, they knew Herod was after them. But I wonder if something about meeting Jesus for the first time changed their perspective. They could no longer fly through life on the most efficient, the fastest path. But instead, well, meeting Jesus changed everything. It forced them to shift gears. They couldn't in this new life with Jesus in their life returned by the same old route. It was a new day that required a new route. You see, I wonder if it changed their perspective. And sort of like that old Highway 61 that we prefer up the North Shore, I wonder if it slowed them down. It forced them to notice things they hadn't noticed before. It gave them a whole new perspective. And so I wonder this Christmas, when it comes to people like you and people like me, what new route is God inviting us on? You see, as we've all encountered Jesus in our own unique ways this Christmas, I wonder what new route is Jesus inviting people like you and people like me to consider as we dive into this new year?
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So Christmas has come and gone. It is the day after Christmas. Later on this week, we will move on and begin to start our New Year's festivities. If your house is anything like my house, there's likely some, some bits of wrapping paper still on the floor, some pine needles that need to be vacuumed up from a tree that's way past its peak. There's some leftovers and there's still some company hanging around, but everyone's walking around kind of slowly kind of zoning out with this day after Christmas, watching movies, uh, recovering from the past two weeks, busy excitement and busyness. You see the kids at this time, they are occupied and they're quiet, uh, taking care of their own needs with their new toys. And and I'm usually trying to figure out what I'm going to do with them for the rest of their school break. The Christmas roller coaster is slowing down and re-entering into the station, being ready to be put away until next year's season. And we do this every year. So I want to wonder with you today, why do we need Christmas? Why do we need to remember the story of Jesus' birth over and over again, year after year? Is that just what we do? Or is it just tradition? Or is there something more to it? Every day when my kids get ready and go to school, I give them a hug and a kiss and I tell them that I love them. And then every night at the end of the day, I tuck them into their bed and I give them a hug and a kiss and I tell them that I love them. At least twice a day, probably more often, many, many times in a day, I sit there and I tell them that I love them. Why do I go through this ritual? Well, let's be honest. I think as people, we are very, very forgetful. 
We forget that we are loved. I, I know I forget that I am loved. I know my husband forgets that he is loved. And I know that my kids forget that they are loved too. Even though I take the time to tell them multiple, multiple times a day, I still sometimes get the question, Mom, do you love me? More than anything at all in the whole world, sweetheart. It's like our insecurities bubble up inside us faster than we can fill up our love bucket. We become so quickly consumed with ourselves that we forget that we are loved. We forget that we belong. We forget that we are enough. So this message, it's something that we need to hear over and over and over and over again. I love you. I really do. I really love you. I really, really love you. I promise I'll always love you. Since the beginning of time, God has been trying to help people understand how much God loves us, how much God would do for us, and how much God would be there for us, and to free us from all the things that hurt in our lives. In the Bible, we read story after story of God trying to show people how enough that they are, how loved by God that they are. So God sends some leaders like, like Noah and Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam to help people see what they are worth to God. And then God sends the Ten Commandments to help them see how they can take care of each other and how much God loves them and wants them to rest. But that doesn't work. So then God sends leaders and warriors like Joshua. But when that doesn't work, God sends judges to help each other, uh, help us understand each other. People like Deborah and Samson. And when that doesn't work, God sends kings to rule over people, to show them how much God cares about them. Kings like David and Solomon. But we, as people, we still struggle. We still, we still take on more than we should, and we still feel like God maybe doesn't love us, doesn't want anything to do with us. See, I think we don't understand how much we mean to God. We don't understand how much our worth is, how much we are valued, cherished, celebrated, how much God delights in us just for being God's. So then God does something that, that no one would imagine. God takes all of this love that God has for us and does something shocking. God takes all of this love that God has for us and puts flesh on it. The Bible says Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee and Judea to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who he was pledged to be married to him, but was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. You see, God entered into our world, not with glory and might, but with weakness and vulnerability and in need in the form of a baby. I mean, think about us for a second. Could you capture all of Niagara Falls in a coffee cup? Could you contain all of the ocean in a shot glass? Could you put the whole of outer space inside a balloon? Could you put all the love of the God of the universe into a baby? But this is exactly how God chooses to enter into the world. To enter into the world with all of its messiness and all its weariness and all of its forgetfulness and all of its mental noise. God comes to us. I mean, why? Why did God bother to come to humanity as a human being, as a baby? I mean, if you're someone who's wrestled with this question, uh, why a God would do such a thing, I mean, I think it seems to be a fair question. I mean, if God is God, why didn't God just go and forgive everyone for all their sins, not go through this living and suffering in the world? I mean, if God is God, why didn't God just send an angel or a bunch of angels to really prove it to us? Or if God is God, why didn't God just send a prophet? But this time, a really, really good one. One that everyone would be sure to believe. Why would God need to come into a human body? Why would God need to come as a fragile, vulnerable baby? But instead of doing all those other things, God demonstrates the height, the depth, the breadth, the width, the intensity of God's love for us by becoming fleshy and personal. 
by becoming intimately understanding of what it means to be human with all of its fragility, vulnerability, with all of its emotions and needs. And God does this so that you could see how enough you are to God, how much you are to God, how much you're worth to God, how loved you are to God. And my friends, this is why we need Christmas. We need Christmas year after year after year to remind us how loved we really are. So as we stare into the manger year after year after year, not out of routine, not out of tradition or obligation, but instead staring at the manger, remarking in amazement and really true shock and awe, about how much God loves us, that God is willing to prove it to us in this baby. Not because of anything we ever did or earned or prepared for. And even if it's once a year, and even if it's this fleeting moment, this experience of the intensity of God's love, God's mercy, and God's grace, now I think that the roller coaster is worth it. My friends, God loves you so much that God demonstrates it for you. God proves God's love to you by sending God's son, and not just on Christmas, but every day of your entire life. My child, I love you. My child, I love you. My child, I love you. My child, God loves you. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us here today for worship. I hope that you have been brought some peace, some peace in the promises of God here at Christmas time. If you're someone who's new to Calvary, we'd love to have you join our email list. You can do this on our website, www.calvaryalex.org, and click on the button that says, I want to sign up for emails. We found that it's the easiest way for us to get the message out of all the things that God is doing through Calvary here at this time. Starting next week, we are so excited to start a new worship series to bring in the new year. We're calling it Asking for a Friend. I mean, sometimes there are those questions that come up in a life of faith, those questions that you're kind of afraid to ask. So you just get nervous and you pretend like you're asking for a friend. But in reality, it's you who really wants to know the answer. Well, we've asked a whole bunch of people what their biggest questions of faith are. Questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? And so throughout January, we're going to take on these big questions of faith in a really honest and open way. I know that you will learn a lot from it. I'm sure that you're going to enjoy it. I hope that you will join us in person or online. And now as we close our time together, we're going to close with a time of offering. We are so grateful for your generosity. Calvary has been so so generous this Christmas season, and we're thankful for you. We are so excited to continue the mission into this next year. There are four ways that you can give, and they're on your screen. The first is that you can go to the website, www.calvaryalex.org, and click on the button that says give. The second is that you can Venmo us with the Venmo handle on your website. The third is that you can write a check and mail it in to 605 Douglas Street, Alexandria, Minnesota, 56308. Or the fourth is that you can give us a call with the number on your screen and we'll help you figure it all out. Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. Have a great day.